Welcome back to Black News Tonight. As we've reported earlier in the show, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, the creator of the 1619 Project, will be joining the faculty at Howard University. She will be a tenured professor serving as the very first night chair in race and journalism. Joining me now to discuss what this means for Howard University as well as the HBCUs across the nation is the Africana scholar extraordinaire, Dr. Greg Carr. Good to see you, my brother. Always good, man. Thanks to, for the invitation, brother. Oh, absolutely, man. What was your reaction to this bombshell of a news? Did y'all know at Howard that this was, uh, and were y'all like all keeping it on the QT or was this a surprise to you too? I heard you riff for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad earlier, except you want to be yourself. Another saying from the Nation of Islam is those that know don't say and those that say don't know, brother. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, but this was, uh, this was fast moving. Um, and of course, you know, uh, Nicole and Tanahasi, both friends of ours. Um, and so we welcomed them with open arms. Uh, that powerful, clear statement that Nicole made earlier, uh, not only today at CBS, but that long written uh, letter that she released under the LDF letter here is very important. Um, very powerful, very clear statement. And uh, at Howard, we've got about 1,200 faculty, um, not the largest HBCU faculty in the country. I think A&T probably has got, they've got close to 2,000. But you know, those numbers range from, you know, the, the institution you served at on faculty, Morehouse, between Morehouse and Spelman, maybe 150, 160 to 170 apiece, another 300 at Clark Atlanta. There are thousands of faculty at HBCUs around the country. We're glad to have Coates and uh, Jones join that number. No, it's a, it's a, it's a great uh, idea watching it happen uh, is is powerful and beautiful uh, for a lot of reasons. How do you think that this move helps Howard? Well, I mean, there's the crass thing. After, after all, we're talking about, uh, you know, basically you've got two names that you can leverage. Uh, I kind of feel like Scott Holloway, the, uh, the business professor at NYU, has been writing recently that a lot of these elite white institutions are basically... Uh, elite brands that's what they're selling is elite brands and we both know working in higher education that that is the trend uh there's a disruption going on right now in higher education and i think you know i don't think that either jones or Coates will be burdened with the type of teaching schedule that you or i or the rank and file uh, at hbcus will have uh, i hope that this will draw attention and i think they're absolutely sincere in their efforts and i think they can use their platform to uh introduce HBCUs, but not just HBCU alumni and students, but HBCU faculty and the challenges we face every day, because the search for truth and justice doesn't stop at the HBCU door that we share with the HWCUs, brother. So I hope I'm hoping that will happen as well. Can we talk about some of the challenges that HBCUs face? Because I think that, you know, for me, this is an opportunity to celebrate what Nicole Hannah-Jones did and what ta Coates did. But I don't want people to think that this successful move and this great PR move and this great substantive move, because again, I, I applaud them and I applaud Howard for making this happen. Um, but I don't want people to think that that erases the challenges that HBCUs wrestle with every single day. What are some of the challenges that historically black colleges and universities face? Well, let's start with the first one. Some of the most brilliant scholars, teachers, uh, thinkers that I know, that you know, we all know, we can name them, roll, call the role, are historically black colleges and universities. So the first thing everyone should immediately scrub from their brains forever is that any act of someone whose name is known beyond the black sphere uh, coming to an HBCU is an act of charity or somehow enhances the faculty in a way that is a, a, a quantum leap. That's not true. That's number one. And I don't think that uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones or Ta-Nehisi Coates think that. Uh, the challenges we face, of course, are many, there's, a, there's a disrespect. I think that disrespect of faculty by administrators is not germane just to white schools. You see it at black schools. In fact, there's often a top-down mentality at HBCUs, as we both know, uh, you know that, that, that this will perhaps allow us to have a conversation about it in a different way. Uh, the idea uh, of uh, teaching and learning. When you start talking about creating a center, I mean, Nicole Hannah Jones bringing $15 million, says she's going to raise another 10 to $25 million. That frees you up from the kind of thing that, you know, we fake grading all the papers and, and managing these large classes. And so, number two, if you think you're coming to Howard University to study with Nicole Hannah Jones or Ta-Nehisi Coates, you will, but it's not going to be in the formation you might think. This isn't a different world or Hillman College, you understand. And uh, finally, in terms <laughs> of conceptions of the university, 
you know, in many ways, uh, I agree with Fred Moten and Stefano Harney. The university is theft. We, sh we shouldn't look at the university as the thing that's going to free us. But that's a very different concept when you start talking about HBCUs, because black people tend to look at HBCUs as the, the rung on the ladder to success, to create generational wealth and collective advancement. That means that teaching at HBCUs becomes a calling as much as it is an academic exercise. And I think a lot of, it, a lot of that gets pushed aside when we see one or two people whose names we know come into a black space. We say, see, this is the most important. No, not at all. Come on and join us and find out that all these brilliant people were here waiting for you. Mm, I think that's the most important piece for me. And you said a lot of important things, but for me, that's the important piece. When I went to Morehouse College to teach, I, I wasn't the smartest person there. I wasn't the best teacher there. Um, there were so many great teachers, so many great uh, minds there, uh, which is what happened when I went there as a student. Similarly, uh, you were an HBCU, uh, not only a student, but you graduated from an HBCU. ta graduated from an HBCU. You graduated from Howard, or he went to Howard. He didn't graduate, but he, he went to Howard. My point being, you know, I think, they, I, I think you're right. They know that tradition, how rich it is, but to the outside world, we can't look at this like, like, like any individual person is, going, is making HBCUs better than they fundamentally already are. Um, but the other piece of this that I think is interesting is that when we see HBCU too often now, and, and this might, I might be misreading this, so please let me know, but too often people are talking about Howard Spellman, Morehouse, you know, Hampton, you know, sometimes, you know, and they're not see, talking see. about... I, <laughs> I did that. I made the I made the, the, the requisite HU joke for you, but no, but but they're not talking about Cheney State. They're not talking about Delaware State. They're not talking about Langston. They're not talking about, quite frankly, the the ninety plus and over a hundred HBCUs that aren't among the elite middle class HBCUs. And in many ways, those are the places that do even the even more difficult work in terms of the types of students they accept, in terms of the type of resources they have access to. I mean. Have we paid enough attention to the run, run, run of the mill, uh, rank and file HBCUs? Well, well, frankly, Mark, I think this is one of the things that we have kind of lost. That Jim Crow, the end of Jim Crow, and the end of segregation, at least de jure uh, segregation, has kind of blurred our vision in. And that is, you know, the idea of how class operates in black communities. Uh, I don't really have a dog in the real HU fight. I went to Tennessee State, and I remind those students at Howard every day, I'm one of those public HBCU field Negroes. I'm one of them moral land grant Negroes, so I'm much <laughs> easier to get in a beef with Jackson State or, or Grambling or FAM than I am, you know, with Hampton. But, 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 you know, the idea that, well, Howard is always getting stuff, and Morehouse is always getting stuff, and Spelman is always getting stuff, let's be very clear. There's a reason why Ruth Simmons went to Prairie View. You see, uh, you know, I've taught classes, and I'm going to tell you right now, SAT scores and grades don't mean a damn thing when you start talking about doing intellectual work in a way that allows people to showcase their natural intelligence and their willingness to apply that intelligence. And so what I don't want to see happen here is the idea that somehow there is a ranked, uh, 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 there's a hierarchy of HBCUs with people at the bottom and people at the top. I can quite frankly tell you that's simply not true. Now, people, you know, there are going to be people who argue with me, including people at Howard. But I'll tell you right now, the faculty at our HBCUs aren't there because they can't go anywhere else. They're there because they chose to be there, just like Nicole and ta are joining us. They chose to join us, and the students they will find there are no smarter or no less intelligent than students at any of the other HBCUs. And there are a lot of people who don't believe that. And, of course, I just laugh at them. Because I'm like, you don't know like I know. In fact, you might know like I know, but what y'all fighting over finally is the brand. You're fighting over the name on the sweatshirt, mm. the network, and the access to uh, this kind of network that allow you to advance. And that is absolutely a class issue that we must confront. I don't know how we do that, though, brother, because it's deeply rooted, as you can imagine, as you know. Deeply rooted. We're going to talk about that and unpack that. We're going to continue to come back to this question around uh, HBCUs because it's so central to what we do as a community and what we do as a show. So... Uh, Dr. Greg, thank you again for joining me. Always a pleasure to have you here. Always, brother. Shout out to the house. You know they still miss you down there in Atlanta, Mark. Oh, man, I miss them, too. I miss, I miss all that HBCU love, man. It's such a beautiful thing, man. We're going to make it happen Let's again. Let's open up a few more spots. Everybody, hey, let man. us know what you, you think. You ready to leave Temple? Hey. Oh, wait. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Well, I'm sorry. Mark, Let's I, not break that my, news on it. My, 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 
<laughs> Look, they if y'all got the, if y'all got the job, I, I I don't need no Nicole Hannah Jones bag, man. I just I just I just I just need a, a regular teaching load in an office with a window, man. And maybe Fried Chicken Wednesday. I'm good. I will be there. Everybody, f Facebook, Twitter, B at BNC News. You can weigh in on the conversation. You can also visit the website BNC.TV.